uh, revelation uh, to the Pope God uh, in the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy. Uh, and I think the analogy is really helpful. Has anyone seen The Gods Must Be Crazy? It's a pretty gag that people know pretty well. Uh, it's a pretty old movie now. Now, if you haven't seen the movie The Gods Must Be Crazy, uh, it's well worth seeing. Let me say, I think, anyway. Now, in this movie, uh, the story sort of kicks off as a pilot flies over the Kalahari Desert, um, which is in the southern part of Africa, flies over the Kalahari Desert and carelessly tosses a Coke bottle uh, out of the plane. Now, the Coke bottle is found by this, uh, this Kalahari tribe who have no idea uh, what it is and what it's for. But they find it and they look at it and they're just mystified by it. Now they find a number of, uh, of uses for it, but ultimately this coke bottle ends up causing great trouble. Uh, it creates jealousy within the tribe, it, it gets misused as a weapon to hurt someone, and in the end they just sort of all sit around looking at this coke bottle, fearful, wondering why in the world the gods gave it to. Now, I think the book of Revelation can be a little bit like that uh, for us, a little bit like that Pope book. You see, unless we work out what it is and what we are supposed to do with it, it, it can be a bit of a mystery to us. It, it contains images that, that are sometimes confusing, images that can be unsettling, stuff that we, we maybe don't quite know what to do with, and that maybe makes us a little bit. Um, over the years, possibly, we've heard other people uh, using the book of Revelation in a way and interpreting in ways that are sort of sensational, and, and that makes us uncomfortable. And the net result is then that I think for many people, uh, the book of Revelation sort of sits at the, the end of our Bibles, maybe largely unread. We occasionally uh, dig into it for its, uh, its beautiful picture of eternity. Uh, or for its sections of praise, but otherwise we sort of avoid it. We confess it's scripture, we say it's part of the word of God, but we just wonder why did God give it to us? And why did he give it to us in the form that he did? And what are we supposed to make of it? Now, if this is the case, if this is the case that we we're a little bit afraid of the book of Revelation and we don't really go into it a lot, then that's a shame. Because we're told in these opening verses two things that should make us stop and reconsider if this is the way we respond to the book of Revelation. The first is that we're told in verse 1 that it was given to reveal, not conceal or confuse. So if it has that effect on us of, of confusing us or, or making the truth seem murkier, then we probably haven't understood it properly. The second thing that we're told in verse 3 is that it was given to be a blessing. It was given to bless those who read it and those who hear it and those who take it to heart. Therefore, if we're avoiding it out of fear or confusion, we're robbing ourselves of something that God has given. A blessing. We're robbing ourselves of blessing. So over the next term and a half, we're going to work our way through this book uh, to see what does God want to show us through it and, and how does he want to bless us so that we can be strengthened as we serve God in this world. Now the first eight, book of, eight verses of the book, uh, we sort of have the book in a nutshell. We're introduced to, to all the main themes of the book here in the introduction, and it sets the scene for, for what's to come, and it really shows us how we are to understand it. Now, I want these, these first eight, unpack these first eight verses, sorry, I want us to look at how the book describes itself through certain key words. I want to look at how the book describes itself through certain key words. Now, the first word we need to look at is the word of revelation itself. In verse 1 we read, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants 
what must soon take place. Now the word translated here, revelation, uh, is the Greek word apocalypsis. The Greek word apocalypsis. Now even if you don't speak or read Greek, um, you probably recognise that word because of its association with the English word apocalyptic. Uh, it's apocalyptic is just a, a transliteration of the Greek word apocalypsis. Now the word apocalyptic uh, has come to mean uh, something very different to the Greek word apocalypsis. Uh, the word apocalyptic uh, is a word that, that is used in our culture to convey fear or, or, or to convey disaster. A word that is used to describe events that, that are considered, considered terrible um, or almost worldly. Uh, last year I was reading an a, a article in the, in the Australian and a particular rain event that was, uh, that was um, forecast for Sydney was describing the Australian as apocalyptic. Uh, that may have been a little dramatic. Now if you read the book of Revelation with this idea in our head, we're going to find ourselves missing the point. Finding the book a threat, not a blessing. Uh, of course, it depends, though, on your relationship with God. Now, the Greek word apocalypse, though, simply means to reveal. It simply means to reveal. There's actually nothing dramatic about the word revelation or apocalypse in the Greek. It's what happens when you're standing on a lookout, shrouded by fog, I don't know if you've ever stood on a lookout shrouded by fog, you can't see anything. It's just a white, white mass. And then a wind blows, and all of a sudden the fog is blown away. And what was once concealed is revealed. Now the fog is gone, you can see the vista. You can understand the lay of the land. You can see what's going on around you. Well, this is what it is. The, the, the word apocalypse means to reveal, to, to pull back the curtain, so to speak. So at the very outset, we're told that this book has been given to help us understand, to take us, uh, to remove the veil. But what is it revealing? What is it revealing? Well, we're told that it's revealing what must soon take place. Revealing what must soon take place. But what does that mean? Now, as we go through the book of Revelation, uh, we're going to see that the book of Revelation is saturated in Old Testament allusions. In fact, you will never really understand the book of Revelation unless you know the Old Testament well, particularly the Old Testament prophets. Now, this phrase. Uh, this phrase, uh, what must soon take place, is an allusion back to Daniel 2. There in Daniel 2, uh, if you know Daniel, uh, Daniel 2, of Daniel, or Daniel, in Daniel 2, uh, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, is given a dream that describes the future. It, it describes an eternal kingdom that, that comes and breaks the kingdoms of the world and grows and grows so that it covers the whole earth. Now there in Daniel, uh, a couple of times, Daniel says that, that this coming kingdom, he says, the great God has shown you what will take place in the future. What will take place in the future. Now the book of Revelation is picking up on this, this uh, prophetic coming kingdom and how it's described as coming in the future, and it's it's saying that the rebel, the, the fulfillment of, of Daniel's prophetic vision of the kingdom of God coming is being fulfilled. That no longer is it in the future, but it must soon take place. It is nigh. It's here. Not only uh, now for us, the kingdom of God. The promised kingdom has come with Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. What the book of Revelation is about then is to describe how then this, this kingdom of God will engage with earthly kingdoms and ultimately triumph. Now this, uh, 
This is reinforced by what John says about um, what the book says about the book in verse 3. At the end of verse 3, it says that the time is near. The time is near. Now, this, this phrase, if you know the Gospels, this phrase is very similar to the phrase that Jesus used when announcing the arrival of the kingdom of God in his own ministry. Say, for example, in Matthew 4, where Jesus says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. The phraseology is nearly the same. What Jesus is announcing is with his coming, the kingdom of God is imminent. It's here. Now, it's important because this shows us that what Revelation is describing is the age in which we live. Now, Neil and I will hope to show you over uh, the next month, uh, term and a half, that Revelation actually gives us a number of descriptions of the same gospel age which John's readers live in and which we live in now. In other words, Revelation is not a sort of timeline of unfolding history that we sort of have to peg ourselves on. What we have in the book of Revelation is repeated cycles, giving us different perspectives on how we should understand the age in which we live now. And you might think then of the, the book of Revelation uh, as, as like a printer, a printer that, that prints one colour at a time. And each time the printer passes, another colour is laid down, and another colour is laid down. And each time the printer passes, the picture uh, grows in its vividness, grows in its detail. Uh, the, the image emerges. And so it is with the book of Revelation. As it, as it unfolds, it gives us uh, the same time period from, from different perspectives. Now, hopefully we'll see that if we, as we have it, that structure as we work our way through the book. So then, Revelation is not a holy future. As we read the book of Revelation, it's not necessarily talking about something that's holy future, nor is it holy past from our perspective. Um, but it's appealing back, appealing back at the veil so that we can understand the spiritual reality that mark the age in which we live. This, this kingdom of God age in which the kingdom of God has been inaugurated in Jesus' life, death and resurrection, but in which it waits to be consummated when he returns. This is, the, this is, what, the, this is what the New Testament refers to as the last days. We, we have lived in the last days since Jesus' resurrection and ascension. And, and we will until he returns. Uh, it does, however, the, the book of Revelation does uh, reveal the certainty, though, of that consummation that we look forward to, giving us multiple pictures of Jesus' ultimate victory in order to strengthen us to remain faithful. Now, in verse 2, we're told that he, that is Jesus, made it known made this revelation known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testifies to everything he saw. That is the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this word is important. This uh, verse is important for helping us to understand how to read the book of Revelation. Now, when it says that Jesus made it known, the word he uses here, uh, is a Greek word which means to signify. He signified it. Uh, now, to signify something means to represent it with a sign or a symbol. And it's really important that you don't confuse the sign with the thing being signified. Now, as a church, uh, you will have noticed as you drive up Armstrong Road, we have a sign out on Armstrong Road there that signifies that they're to, to make known, to let it be known that we have a church that meets in this building. Now, if you, if someone was, if you were to invite someone to church and they would come and see the sign and think that that sign was church, they would be horribly disappointed because the sign is not the thing. The sign simply points to the reality.
Now, this is how the book of Revelation works. The truth that we, we get pictures, symbols that are pointing to something beyond themselves and we need to remember that and not confuse the sign with what it's pointing to. Now this truth is reinforced by what John says in verse 2. Uh, is recorded in much of the book of Revelation. What we have in Revelation, John tells us, is what he saw. It's what John saw. Much of the book is given in pictures, visions, images. The pictures convey the word of God and the testimony of Jesus, we're told. But they are the, they, the pictures are the means, not the realities themselves. So it's important as we read the book of Revelation that we always ask, what is the sign pointing to? What is, it, what is this picture representing? Much misunderstanding of the book of Revelation comes from taking the signs too literally uh, and not asking what are they signifying? What is the spiritual truth that is being pictured? So it's important that we, that we that we take the whole picture too and not just fixate only on small parts of the details. It's also important to interpret the pictures in the light of the rest of the Word of God, both in the Old Testament and the New Testament, to remember that the pictures are actually helping to reveal what has already been said in the New Testament. Now this brings us uh, to the next thing that Revelation says about itself. And that is that it's a prophecy. A prophecy. In verse 3, Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and take to heart what is written, because the time is near. Now, unfortunately, when people hear the word prophecy in, in our popular culture, they immediately limit it purely to foretell, to predicting the future. However, biblical prophecy is far more than just predicting the future. And Revelation stands in the tradition of the biblical prophets. We'll see that because it's saturated in the imagery that is found in the prophets in the Old Testament. Uh, and it stands, the Revelation stands in that tradition of biblical prophets whose main job was actually to call God's people to faithfulness. Now they did that by warnings and by promises of the future. But they did it too by challenging the people about their present priorities. They challenged the people about being faithful to God's will that had been revealed. The prophetic role of, of challenging people to faithfulness is sometimes called prophetic forthtelling. Forthtelling. Now that, that is, the prophet spoke for God to his people by forthtelling, by through forthtelling, that is challenging them about living faithfully in the light of what they know, but also through foretelling. Now, if we go through Revelation, we're going to see that its primary role as a prophecy is actually to call us to faithfulness and perseverance in the present, in our present uh, lives, as we as we live kingdom lives for God in the midst of spiritual battle. Now, this truth, this truth that it's, it's about faithfulness in the midst of, of the lives that we live, understanding the spiritual battle that we live in, this truth is driven home by the reality that the book of Revelation is rooted in a historical situation, written to real people who are part of historical churches. Now, you'll notice that in verse 4, that the introduction finishes, uh, where the introduction finishes, that the book takes on the form of a letter. Now this means that we can't just treat Revelation as, a, as an abstract prophecy, predicting future events that made absolutely no sense to its, its past, to its um, first readers. It was a letter given to first century believers to help them understand what remaining faith Jesus was going to mean for them, and how to understand the spiritual battle that they were involved in 
from heaven's perspective. Uh, now John, uh, the John that wrote the letter, uh, was probably, probably the Apostle John, um, but we're not 100% sure. Uh, now he's writing to churches, probably around, uh, maybe probably a little bit after 90 AD, so this is towards the end of the first century, and he's writing to churches that were in uh, what was called then Asia Minor, uh, which is modern day Turkey. But importantly, it was an area that was under the rule, under the power of the Roman Empire. Now this means that whenever we read Revelation, we first need to ask, what did this mean in its first century context? We first have to ask, what did this mean in its first century context? Now in the light of that, what John says next is significant. Having introduced himself and his readers, he then gives them this beautiful greeting uh, in, um, in verses, uh, the end of verse 4 and 5. He says, Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now, in this greeting, uh, John does two important things. Two important things. First of all, he reminds his readers of who God is. He reminds his readers of the triune God's sovereignty and power. Father, Spirit, Son. That God is eternal. He who was and who is and who is to come. He is eternal. And that whatever they are experiencing is only temporary. That, that God is over it. That his throne is higher than any earthly throne. That his power is greater than any earthly power. Secondly, he reminds them of what Jesus has achieved. He reminds them that, that Jesus remained faithful. He was a faithful witness for God. He remained faithful as God's witness to the God's kingdom and of God's love, even to the point of death. He reminds them that Jesus rose again. Though he died, he rose again and now stands as the beginning of God's new creation. That it describes Jesus here as the firstborn from among the dead because there is a greater birth to happen. That is the new creation that God's people participate in. Jesus is the firstborn. And he reminds them that Jesus, not Caesar, holds the real authority as the ruler of the kings of the earth. Now all this is important because, because John's first readers are being called to maintain their faithful witness to Jesus, being maintained, are called to maintain their faith in the light of increasing state persecution from Rome. Now in, in AD 90, so just a couple of years before John's writing probably, uh, the em under the emperor, um, the Roman emperor Domitian, the Roman Empire received a new name. It received a new name. Uh, it was declared to be the eternal kingdom. And the emperor was declared to be the eternal king. That's not too pretentious, is it? But this is the world that, that the first readers were living in. Increasingly, the emperor was being worshipped as divine. And people were expected to bow down to him and perfect Caesar is Lord, even Caesar is God. Now what John declares about Jesus in these opening verses, this is political dynamite. This is political dynamite. Jesus, that, that Jesus, not Caesar, was Lord. That Jesus, not Caesar, was the ruler of the kings of the earth. To, to hold this confession in the face of Rome, was to risk severe persecution, even death. 
Now, if Jesus' followers are to maintain their faithful witness, they needed to know that Jesus was more powerful and that he would triumph. And so Jesus gave, God gave through Jesus, Jesus' church, the book of Revelation, to bless them and strengthen them in the face of coming persecution, to guarantee them that, this, that despite appearances, Jesus would be the victor, that he alone was the one who should be worshipped. Now, now, we live in a different stage of history, and the nature of persecution is different, but the book of Revelation is still a powerful reminder to us of the spiritual truths that we need to continue to stand on. We need to continue to stand on the truth that God is still eternally sovereign over this world. We need to stand on the truth that Jesus is still the ruler of the kings of the earth. And John reminds us in verse 6 that Jesus still loves us with a sacrificial love such that he was willing to lay down his life to open the way for us to belong to God's eternal kingdom that had been established in Christ, established in his death and resurrection, but a kingdom which continues to grow, as, as Daniel foresaw it would, a, continue, a kingdom that continues to grow despite the world's opposition, a kingdom that will ultimately be victorious. Now these are truths reinforced by the visions of Revelation. And then these are truths that we need to know and we need to take to heart so that we will remain faithful, so that we will remain strong, whatever might come. So as you prepare, as you prepare to study the book of Revelation, prepare to be blown away by the power of God. Prepare to be struck again and again by the sacrificial love of the Lamb. Prepare to be warned against belittling the judgment of God. Prepare to be enlightened so that you can understand the spiritual battle that rages all around you. And prepare to be challenged and encouraged to remain faithful despite the threat of worldly oppression despite the temptation to give him. Let me pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you so much for this book that we are about to, to set upon you. Father, we thank you so much for this, this introduction which, which gives us such a beautiful picture of what it is and, and why you have given it. Father, we pray we pray that we would indeed be blessed by the truths that it holds. The truths that are presented to us of your sovereignty, of your power, of Jesus' ability to save, of the fact that ultimately Jesus will be victorious, that ultimately Jesus wins. Father, we pray that you would strengthen us to trust you and to follow your faith. Lord, maintaining our witness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to um, we're going to stand. Uh, we're going to respond to God's word.